Day three of the Genesis creation story finds a very active deity. In the prior two days, God moved across pre-existent primordial waters and created life. Water, however, as we've noted, could not have existed in the early universe, as there was no oxygen yet formed to bond with hydrogen. In the biblical account of the first day of creation, God also creates light, and this, too, is in contradiction with what we know through modern science. Both oxygen and light need stars, and stars did not exist in the universe until it was about 200 million years old. On day two of creation, Genesis reports God forming a bubble in the primordial waters, separating them. This space is called heaven, or the sky. However, the sky, or Earth's atmosphere, if this is what Genesis is referring to, did not exist for billions of years following the beginning of the universe. And the Earth's sky, the one we see today, did not form around the Earth until the Earth itself was a few billion years old. The seas and land had long been present on the planet's surface. Up to this point, the Genesis account of creation has been far off what is known about the formation of our universe from modern science. Will day three fare any better? Or will we again uncover more of what Genesis got wrong? And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. On the third day of creation, according to Genesis, not only was dry land created out of the waters below the sky, or firmament, but also all the land plants were formed. Specifically mentioned are grass, herbs with seeds, and fruit trees. In one day, Genesis got more wrong than in the previous two days combined. Dry land was first to appear on the earth long before it was covered by seas. The early earth, in fact, had no seas, only a thin, rocky crust. 4.4 billion years ago, the Earth was around 100 million years old. Meteors still crashed into the planet, but gradual cooling of the core had allowed most of the surface to solidify into a crust of dark volcanic rock. It was not for about 500 million years after the formation of the planet that water first began to rain down and cover the earth. As it evaporated off the surface, huge amounts of water vapor rose to join the carbon dioxide in the young atmosphere, forming thick, blanketing clouds. This condensing water would trigger the greatest downpour the earth would ever see. As thunderstorms rocked the skies, the rain began to fall on the rocky surface below. And it kept on falling. It would rain for millions and millions and millions of years. The result would be a water world. 4 billion years ago, the Earth was now half a billion years old. Over 90% of its surface had become a vast ocean. Small volcanic islands poked out from the waves. The monstrous seas were iron rich, making them an olive green color. Carbon dioxide filled the sky so thickly that they appeared red. The dense atmosphere produced enough pressure 
to crush a human body flat. And it was hot. Temperatures exceeded 200 degrees Fahrenheit. This toxic, hostile water world would remain for another half billion years. However, this early crust of the Earth, the small volcanic islands rising out of the iron-rich seas, was not the same rock which would become the continents, the land upon which plants would grow and animals would wander. The continents of our world indeed formed much later in Earth's history. 3.4 billion years ago, the Earth was just over a billion years old. None of the crumbling volcanic islands dotting the surface survived the punishing seas for long. But everything was about to change. An upsurge in undersea volcanic activity was about to create a tougher type of rock and give birth to the continents. 3.5 billion years ago, granite was appearing everywhere. An upsurge of volcanism had fractured the crust of the earth underneath the vast oceans, allowing water to plunge into the cracks alongside the molten lavas. The mixture of superheated water and basaltic lava produced the new rock, granite. It rose from the depths to form the first true continental crust. For the next couple of billion years, slowly but surely, the granitoid protocontinents grew larger. On different parts of the globe, granite crust appeared that would one day form the hearts of the major land masses. The dominance of the oceans was over. The continents had arrived. And thus again, Genesis got it wrong. The earth did not start out under a massive sea of primordial waters called forth by God to part them as Moses parted the Red Sea. The earth started out as a molten ball of superheated rock which slowly cooled to a thin crust. Then the water came, raining down for millions upon millions of years onto this proto-surface. Volcanic activity pushed islands of this early crust up through the oceans, mimicking in a way what Genesis reports. However, these early islands were weak, delicate. The water wore them down, and millions of years later, other titanic forces within the earth again pushed rock over the waves. But this rock was sturdier, able to withstand the punishment of the massive ocean waves. This was the second time Earth erupted from the seas, and this time the core of our present-day continents were formed. But these islands in the vast, green, iron-rich oceans were barren, totally devoid of life, nothing at all, like what Genesis describes next on Day 3.